So, hi everyone, thanks for attending this session where I'm going to share one of our recent adventures, um, development adventures. I'm going to invite you to follow me in a journey into understanding how to make use of Postgres logical replication in order to develop custom applications. Um, I do it in hopes that you will gain some insights and hints on how to work with Postgres logical replications replication without having to go through the same pains that we did. Um, so, a bit of context. I've been a multifunctional IT guy for the last decade, uh, mostly focusing on the development side of things, uh, but with Postgres always very close by. And due to that, today I'm a DBA for Toggle Track, the time tracking company. And that has been going on for a little more than two years now. When I joined Toggle Track, my mission was a very generic one. When it was centered around getting our Postgres monolithic database into shape. Um, so as time went by, and I started to get deeper knowledge into our processes on and how our systems worked, I started to notice this struggle to serve all, all app usages, meaning our reporting features. Uh, while keeping the natural OLTP shape of our transactional databases. You know, we pushed more and more to provide better reporting capabilities, uh, more reports, reports over more data, with more transformations, with more insights, well, more of everything. But at the end of the day, our reports would still run on top of our normalized data structures on our transactional databases. So long story short, we needed to move, hydrate, and transform our normalized data structures into something more report friendly. Um, as so, we started to look into what could be done, uh, what solutions were out there, and by the end of it, we just decided to build our own in house CDC pipeline on which ETL processes would hang on to build and keep up to date uh, our newly developed data sets. All of these because we had this very important requirement in mind, which was to keep our reporting capabilities as close to real time as they can be. That means that a periodical data extraction would not do the job, while a CDC pipeline would put in place a reliable data stream of uh, changes happening on our transactional database that we can then later on uh, used to keep our data sets up to date, along with other use cases. And of course, that uh, data stream would happen in the close to real time fashion. Um, the end goal was to reduce as much as possible runtime computing in order to serve a given report. Uh, and of course, make that data easy enough to be retrieved over di different dimensions. That often means that we would need to sacrifice some storage in order to report, to reduce our computing needs. Um, here was where our own journey into Postgres logical replication started. Uh, we chose to leverage Postgres functionality in order to achieve our requirements. And at the end of the day, our new all app databases are also Postgres databases, where we not only keep or new information, or new all app information, uh, but that we also use uh, to make much of the heavy lifting effort when it comes to transform that data. Um, we are big Golang fans, so we decided to develop our logical replication uh, client app in Golang using Piggy Log Apple, or however that package name is pronounced. Um, that would be the application that would sit on top of Postgres logical replication and would receive, this, receive the stream of data. Um, I got lost. Uh, we end up with a very, very simple implementation. Uh, and it looks like this, the main bits of it. Uh, but given the particular way on how we wanted to use that data, we end up in extending this very simplistic implementation with a few supporting features, mostly around uh, uploading that same data, those 
the data changing events that we received from logical replication stream into uh, event messaging service. And this is an important bit of information uh, when it comes to this stage on our journey, is that we can only for data changing events traveling in the logical replication stream. We cared for inserts, for updates, also deletes and truncates, but not too much about those because those operations are actually forbidden on our production databases, uh, at least for non-super users. Um, this makes sense at the time because we knew that for a given data changing event to make it into Postgres logical replication, that change had to already be committed. So we didn't see any use of keeping track of any other event like transaction starts and transaction ends. Uh, looking back, of course, that was a very crappy idea. Um, to make our logical replication client work, it needs a replication slot, same as any other client application, including Postgres itself. Uh, the replication slot, one of the replication slot responsibilities is to keep track of replication consumption by its client. And that tracking is done using LSNs, um, LSN offsets. Briefly, uh, we are in a Postgres conference, LSNs or log sequence numbers are numeric values, incremental, that point to a given location in the wall file. Um, and that's the sequence that you need to keep track of in order to report your logical replication consumption to your replication slot. Um, that allows first for you not to receive that data again, but also to allow Postgres to flush wall files containing old, da old data that in theory you should no longer need because you already consumed. But that's assuming that you have no other logical replication endeavors going on. Here are some examples on how those offsets look like. Um, in the first example, we have a transaction start, an insert, a couple updates, and a commit. Um, and by the way, this was the most the operation that would mostly run on our, our database still a few months ago. Um, the second example is almost the same thing uh, with a, a few uh, operation changes. And the third example is on how that uh, looks like with a single operation. Note that all three examples have begin and commit operations there, events that I said before we were ignoring. Um, from this point forward, I'm just going to simplify the LSN notation. I'm going to drop the hexadecimal representation, I'm, and I'm just refer, going to refer to LSNs as sequences of numbers prefixed by LSN. Of course, real LSNs will not have predictable values. They are the result of whatever offset we have today, plus whatever message size comes next. Uh, but it's not really about representation. What's important here is that you know that the incrementality of the sequence of the lack of it, or the lack of it. Oh, sorry, I broke something. Okay, we survive it. So, if you notice, till now, um, I've been showing you uh, incremental LSN sequences, uh, meaning that we can see that whatever uh, value of the next LSN comes, it will follow the operation order. Uh, this doesn't always happen, but it's very, something very easy to assume that it does. We kind of fell for that. Um, without concurrency, uh, our Postgres data changing queries will always produce incremental LSNs offsets across the board. That makes sense because we are simply applying to the log, writing to the log, appending to the log uh, in an order of fashion. Um, in the slide, we can see the operations being executed, there, the transactions to which they belong, 
also in different colors, and the LSN is attributed to them. In the second column, we can see how that information would be written to the log. Without concurrency, there isn't much to it. Uh, there is a direct match. Um, this is how we can visualize a wall file written under such conditions. Uh, note that in the first transaction, I, had to, I added there in the vertical the transaction start and the transaction end, but I just abstracted, to the, abstracted those events from the next transactions. To mention to you again, we were not caring for them. Postgres would still send them, they are still there, they are still being streamed, it's just that our client application was completely ignoring them. And this is how um, that same set of operations will look like under, when they are applied under concurrency conditions. We can see that the first transaction started, the first few operations of it were committed to the log, then the second transaction came in, the same happened, the first few operations of it were uh, written to the log, then the same happened for the third, and as individual changes for those operations reached the log, LSN would always, in, uh, Postgres would always attribute incremental offsets to them, uh, but not caring much about uh, what transaction do those individual operations belong. Um, we see also that the second transaction is actually the first one to commit, then the third, and finally the first transaction to start is actually the last one uh, to end. This is how we can visualize a wall file uh, for those sample operations written under concurrency transactions. Note that here I didn't abstract transactions start and transaction ends because they are actually needed to make sense of it. In some, Postgres will attribute LSN offsets as individual events for the, a given transaction reach the log without caring for the transactional boundary. And it's when those individual transaction events reach the log that they get attributed to an LSN offset. Um, as we were caring only for data changing events, all that we had to work with were those events and their offsets. Uh, we had a number of operations being executed. You can find that on the first column. Uh, if apply under concurrency conditions, uh, Postgres would be logging those operations in a different order to the log, and you can find that in the second column. And at the end of it, logical replication stream would stream that same data in with uh, non-consecutive uh, LSN incrementation uh, within the transaction itself in a completely different order, and you can find that in the third column. Note again that the first transaction to start is actually the last one to be streamed in logical replication, and we will see why. At this point in our journey, we were still dead set on using only data changing events. Uh, we thought that that would simplify our process, and we didn't realize yet at this stage that we would need to change that. Sorry, we have a uh, video recording. That's why we need to use microphone to ask questions. Can the previous, in this slide, the, are those transactions changing the same data or? Different data. Ah, okay, because they would be it would not make other. any sense to reorder it. Yes, uh, the, the, the different transactions would change different sets of data. Otherwise, you would run into locking issues and this wouldn't apply. Um, so I was, as I was saying, uh, we still thought that caring only for data changing events uh, would get our job done. Uh, you know, we would keep track of LSN one, two, three, four, wherever. We would use the last data changing event consumed by our client offset to communicate our replication. Uh, consumption to communicate our replication consumption progress to Postgres and at the end of it we would either lose data for lower offsets or end up replicating data for higher offsets. Uh, we made a bunch of bad assumptions and the first one was that LSN offsets would be incremental across transactions. As we saw under concurrency conditions that was not the case. Uh, the second bad assumption was that 
we cared only for the offsets coming in data changing events. Uh, again, as we knew that uh, for a given change, uh, change event to make it through logical replication stream, that change have to already be committed. So we assumed that caring only for those events would do the job. Of course, there were attenuating circumstances uh, to our bad assumptions. At the time, for the first usage of our newly developed all-app ETL-based system, um, we didn't really care for operation order. Uh, we were summing up time, uh, so we didn't look deep enough into how we were getting the information, just that we were getting all of it. And, well, that always happened in close to ideal scenarios. Uh, for those aggregations, it didn't really matter if we sum up 10 and then subtract five hours or do other way around. But if all the data was received, uh, we were good to go, so we didn't look that much into it. Um, also, a side note to this was that uh, for us, delete updates were actually negative, sorry, delete events were actually negative updates because of the soft deletion, so no reason to look any further. Well, apart from this very bad excuse on how we end up scratching our heads to figure out why we were seeing consistent data on our all apt transformations in production, um, we were also not generating the right conditions to test for concurrency issues. Uh, that's mostly why we didn't have enough information to figure out the issue faster. And on top of that, we also managed to mitigate it so well that at some point we were only seeing data inconsistencies in production and very sporadically. Um, that didn't really help debugging and also masked the issue for a while. Um, at the end, we eventually uh, managed to trace down those uh, data inconsistencies into periods of time in which our client redeploy and therefore reconnected to the logical replication stream. And we also noticed that those inconsistencies would have higher probability of happening if they would match with periods of the day in which we have higher KPSs. Um, that would make uh, the chances of our logical replication client exiting, having last consumed uh, event with a data changing event with an offset out of order in the sense of uh, the data that was to come next in that in the in the next transaction. Uh, those chances would be higher, so we had more probability of ending up with inconsistent data. Um, another side note here was that this data was in no way exposed to our users till we got 100% confident that our extraction and transformations were working, and that took a while. Um, I would say that that's enough expectation building. Uh, eventually we figure out that we were doing something horribly wrong. Uh, the first clue was always there and was that Postgres itself you can use logical replication to keep uh, replicas in sync and well those replicas restart, crash and burn and still manage to recover without any data inconsistencies. Uh, the first, the second clue was that we actually went and looked at Postgres source code, specifically on the bit that allowed us to understand the process behind piggy, uh, piggy output, which is the logical replication decoding plugin that we use. And the turn and final breakthrough was actually getting in touch with Postgres uh, developers through the mailing list and slowly through the different replies on the different problems that we were figuring out, we managed to put together the picture on how logical replication offset tracking works and how it's expected to be used. So what did we do wrong? Um, I already mentioned most of the wrongs. Um, we thought that LSN offsets would be incremental. Uh, incrementality on LSN offsets is not insured, uh, not cross-transaction, nor should be expected. 
uh, by expecting it, we went into this spiral of ways on not to track logical replication. No matter how good our mitigation processes were, they were still doomed to fail, specifically during client reconnects. Um, if you look at the slides, um, if our client was to exit on offset 5 there, uh, we would use that offset to report our consumption progress to Postgres and then either end up artificially escaping the next operation for the next, sorry, the first operation for the next transaction or duplicating that data. And I say artificially escaping because Postgres will still send it as we are going to see next, uh, but if we were to take the last consumed offset and filter out data in order not to duplicate it, we would end up discarding data that was uh, indeed needed. Uh, another wrong related to this was that um, we used oper oper individual operations, individual data changing operations to commit our consumption progress instead of transaction ends. Uh, we were not caring for transaction events, uh, so when our client exit, uh, we would commit the last data changing event, as I just told you. Um, that in turn would make Postgres to resend the entire last date, the entire transaction data all over again, um, and that would effectively duplicate those uh, data changing events on our. Uh, transformations, uh, or if we were to artificially escape that duplicated data, we would run into the other problem, which was um, escaping data that was needed elsewhere, as is the example of the offset four for the next, for the first event of the second transaction. Uh, to be completely clear, no filtering on the client side is needed. We only assumed so because we were fooled by Postgres resending the entire transaction data for the transaction that we just end up consuming. Uh, because if Postgres will only mark a given transaction as consumed by the logical replication client, if the uh, re consumption report that we send him has an LSN offset of either equal or higher value to that transaction end offset. Uh, so after we, real, we realized what we were doing wrong, uh, we came to draw hard facts that we can rely on to work towards a proper solution. The first one is that logical replication works over TCP. Uh, this means that we will never receive the next event without acknowledging the first one, which ensures that whatever offset comes next, it will not be out of order in the sense that it will be for sure um, abiding by Postgres logical replication rules. Um, we could also discard networking interference in this process. And secondly, I got lost again. Secondly, the only event that we can count on being incremental, that we have insurance to be incremental uh, across the board is the transaction end event. Uh, because, well, Postgres will only log one event at the time. And uh, the logical replication stream actually streams data sorted by transaction end offsets. Um, also, not using the transaction end offset uh, to commit our replication consumption progress, uh, it would trigger Postgres to resend the entire transaction all over again. And we confirm that all the events for a given transaction in logical replication are always streamed together. Uh, that means that uh, having TCP uh, ensuring that the next event uh, will always come after we acknowledge the last one, we can count on Postgres only sending uh, the data for the next transaction when we are truly done with the first one. Um, here I try to explain again that uh, only committing a transaction end offset to Postgres ensures that the transaction will be marked as consumed uh, to the replication slot and therefore well files flushed. But on our end, this means that uh, the transaction end offset commit 
could only happen after we successfully upload all the data, uh, all the data changing events that we cared about to our messaging service. And that uh, regardless of the commit offset for the first transaction having higher numeric value than some of the next transaction events, we would still receive the next transaction in its entirety for the same reason that we were getting duplicated data. Um, after realizing our wrongs, it was not that hard to get our affairs in order, literally. Um, we changed our approach to only commit on our consumption progress to Postgres, um, transaction end offsets, and only those offsets alone. Um, for that, we make sure that we would treat all transaction data changing events with the transactional integrity that they entail. Uh, meaning, again, that uh, we make sure that we upload all transaction events received for that data changing events received for that transaction uh, before we actually advance our consumption offset and communicate that to the replication slot. At this point, we were confident that um, our logical replication client was working as expected. Uh, however, our tail doesn't quite end here. But this last part is more about the intricacies of our solution rather than the logical replication process in itself. And the first intricacy was that messaging, size, messaging services have limited messaging sizes. And as we started to treat transactions as a whole, we started to hit them. Um, and that's because a Postgres transaction can very well have millions of data changing events. By moving uh, our consumption offset only when the commit event was received, and by trying to enforce transactional integrity on data upload, uh, we end up with a client um, vulnerable to out of memory incidents, no matter how generously we would add memory to our client. On the other side, if we tried to chunk that data upload, uh, we would end to, to respect the maxes, maximum message size for our event messaging service, we would end up creating the perfect conditions for data duplication, either on plug off events or just general erroring. So, while making the proper use of the LSN offset um, fully prevents data loss, it doesn't prevent data duplication. At the end of the day, respecting the transactional integrity while managing capacity constraints was not free of charge, and we end up having to split our transactional data when the transaction size was significant enough. And due to that, under the wrong circumstances, we may still end up duplicating data. Uh, if we were consuming a transaction and somewhere in the middle of it, uh, we got an error, uh, that would mean that our offset would not advance because we didn't get to uh, process all the data in that transaction. And in turn, when our client redeployed or restarted, that we would still receive all data for that transaction, which means that the duplication would occur. Uh, in our particular use case, um, oh, before that, uh, another instance where data duplication can happen is if after successfully receiving all the data for a transaction and successfully uploading all that data, we are for some reason unable to to, to communicate our consumption progress to Postgres. And on our particular use case, and as I was just saying, we end up to have, having uh, to embrace duplication possibilities. Um, I, I would expect most of your use cases to have to do the same unless you put in place some uh, active mechanisms to prevent uh, such big transactions to happen and or um, implement some state management solution on top of your client application, which would imply to thicken your consumption layer on top of Postgres, uh, which we wanted um, and managed to avoid. So today, I'm proud to announce that if you go to Toggle Track, you create an account, you create a project, and track time to it, 
uh, the total time that you see in the number of places across our client applications is actually a result of this process. One of the few use cases that are already in production and one of the few applications unlocked by it that we are actively working on. And this is the end of our journey. I expect that sharing such adventures is helpful for others. I hope that you take something home from it and that next time that you need to work with Postgres logical replication, you don't get stuck around realizing these same problems because, well, being aware of them is already an important state to be in. Unfortunately for these, you don't find straightforward answers in the documentation and you can even be misled by outsourced implementations that, out, that are out there that um, either don't care for uh, data consistency at all or just don't care for the entire process, as I found. Um, some even went as far as in the documentation to just suggest you to make sure that you wait long enough to consume all the data, which of course is impossible to do uh, in, with a live application. Open to any questions if you have them. Okay, so we have like 15 minutes for questions. Fair up. I have uh, two questions. One is, uh, you talked about messaging service. Uh, which was it? And uh, second is, you are saying either consume all for a transaction, then say you are done. But this problem is for anything, right? You are committing your offset into a different system and then writing your data into a different system. You will always fall into this trap because it's, you cannot have a transaction in this way. Do, do, those two are two different systems, and yes. one of them can fail independently at any point of time. Yeah, so the, to the first question, yeah. any messaging service has limited message sizes. Okay. We can be talking about Kafka or PubSub or whatever you are using, so it's not really relevant. As the second question, I think that you are asking about the fact that we need to uh, communicate our consumption progress to Postgres while we would still be managing data upload to an event messaging service that is living elsewhere. And well, that's why I said that um, unless you thicken your consumption layer on top of Postgres to keep some sort of st uh, state management to figure out what you already consumed or not, you will end up duplicating the data because you, you are trying to marry these two async processes. I'm not sure if I answer. It has nothing to do with the messaging service that you are using. It will always be the problem, whatever messaging service you use. Yes. Okay. So uh, why, do, why do you didn't use uh, Debezium? Or uh, why, why, what was the motivation behind creating your own CDC pipeline? Uh, because we wanted control over what we would send to our CDC pipeline because we make use of those events not only to keep our the new data sets up to date that could require hydration for instance um, but also for other use cases like uh, delivering an email alert. Division uh, wouldn't allow us to do such customization across the pipeline. Right, so we use the Visium uh, to replicate data on another system. And sometimes uh, it happens that the server is starting accumulating wall files, and then we get a warning from the monitoring system that the disk is rising, and that's uh, 10, 20, 70 gigabytes of wall files that shouldn't be there. And the, the thing that you explained that you commit only the transaction uh, transaction, last, uh, transaction commit message to the replica. Explain it, because we have really long run transactions for a couple of days, and we see the LSNs uh, that are on the replication slot not advancing. So when we kill those backends, everything returns to normal. Yes. Uh, so now I know why. <laughs> I did want to to say it, but you said it, and that's one of the open source projects that I was talking about. Don't kill backends. Any questions? 
Okay, I have one. Can you show us, please, your Golan code? That's not complete, by the way. <laughs> that doesn't work. <laughs> but you can find very similar implementations to the basic form of it. So, yeah, my uh, question is, why do you discard error results? Like, all errors are ignored in this code. You mean the primary keep alive messaging? I mean, like, raw message, comma, then underscore mean ignore error. Oh, message, comma, underscore ignore error. That is a very simple explanation, was that I had to put this in only in one slide. OK. And if I would put the errors there, I would have to put three more lines to treat them. Yeah, so that's I true. Just took that's them true. Off. Go is very chatty. <laughs> yes. More questions? Yep. Very nice presentation. And yeah, I mean, I've had problems with the DBZM in the past. Uh, what about options with just native Postgres logical replication? Is that just, I mean, that's always my instincts. Why, what were the problems which stopped you using that for your, your CDC? It's not customizable? I'm just curious. Well, you still need something to retrieve your uh, logical replication data and deliver it to wherever it needs to, to go. Um, honestly, I didn't look into solutions to do that directly from Postgres. Um, but it just seems better to have control over your consumption layer. Uh, because, well, logical replication replicas, um, they have the advantage of having a database in hand. Uh, we didn't have, we didn't want it to add that extra layer. Uh, as I said, we didn't want it to thicken the consumption layer on top of Postgres. Um, so we just thought that the better way to manage that was to build our custom uh, data uploading thing and at the other end of the pipeline worry about things like duplication. Um, as I said, if you properly keep track and properly report your consumption offset progress to Postgres, that will ensure that you will never lose data. Uh, but a number of things can happen that will cause you to duplicate data. Uh, if you have the entire process, control over the entire process, you could put uh, mitigation measures in place. And we choose to do that at the under end of the pipeline on our transformations because we do have like primary keys that uniquely identify the data that we are changing. So we didn't have to care that for that too much. And that would avoid us to have to manage another database in order to manage the state of our consumption from our side. Um, I'm not familiar with other solutions to do this, but I, I would expect that wherever you end up using to retrieve data directly from Postgres, to have to save that state somewhere. Any questions? Thank you, Jose. Very Thank good. Thank you very much.